Welcome to the first Last Dogs Prevention webinar. We're super stoked to be doing this. Um, it's something that we've wanted to do for a while. Um, Last Dog Prevention is really important to us. As you know, or you might not know, Secondhand Hounds rescues around 2,500 dogs per year. And um, a lot of those dogs come from situations that they're um, they're scared. They're, they're newly in, integrated into homes. They might be coming from puppy mills or shelters, or they just weren't socialized well as puppies. And it's really important for all of us to make sure that we are doing our best to keep them safe. And when they do get out, that we have a good process and procedure to get them back to their foster home safely. Um, and so we have a really great team of experts here tonight. But first, I wanted to introduce all of you to Courtney. Um, Courtney is, uh, well, I'll let her introduce herself, but I'm going to say she is a board member and um, from Thrivent. And Thrivent has supported this entire event. And I have some really cool stuff to tell you about Thrivent in a second. But I'm going to let Courtney say hey really quick. Hey guys, Courtney. Um, love Secondhand Hounds, obviously. Like Rachel said, I'm a board member. I've been around since about 2011 as a volunteer, a foster, an adopter, pretty much whatever Rach needs, I show up. But thankfully, I work for a super amazing company that helps support a lot of this. Uh, one of our coolest things is giving back to the community. Um, super passionate about lost dogs. I myself have, gosh, I could cry, one of my residents got away. So I think that this is so valuable for all of us to learn even when we think we know what to do and we don't. So I'm excited to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. Yay! Um, and Thrivent has um, made it possible for us to purchase over 400 Martingale collars. You're gonna learn about Martingale collars. I'm super pumped about that as well. Um, and so we're just really thankful for Thrivent for making this all possible. So I'm going to kind of go through really quick who is going to be speaking tonight. Um, and when I say your name, I would love it if you would give a little wave so that we know who you are. Um, first, we have Barb Godding from Dog Talk Training Minnesota. Um, so she is with her little pity friend who's going to show and demonstrate all of the uh, how, to, how to keep your animal safe. She is a great trainer. She's who we work with to keep all of our dogs safe and also to train any of those pesky behaviors. So I have to recommend, I'm going to give her a little shout out. If you're having any training issues, Awesome. She's amazing. Dog Talk Training Minnesota. Go find her. Her name is Barb. She's the best. Next, we have Jessica Standard. Let's give a little wave. Hi. She's our last dogs coordinator. So when dogs do go missing, Jessica is boots on the ground, um, as well as Carrie. Carrie Openshaw, give a little wave. She's programs director. Um, she and uh, Jessica work together uh, to make sure that we get these animals back in their homes. Jessica, pretty recently started this position and has been kicking butt so far. So we're super excited to learn more from Jessica tonight. Next, we have Heidi Burley, who is our microchip coordinator. There's Heidi. Uh, and she's gonna talk a little bit about microchips, what they actually do. We have some myth busters happening maybe, um, and how to utilize those to the best of our ability. And then we have Kelly Tomasino, who is our dog training coordinator. So if you ever do work with Barb with one of your fosters, you have talked to Kelly. I hope you should have. Uh, Kelly is amazing. She's going to be fielding your questions tonight and kind of playing moderator a little bit. So you might hear her pop in and out, um, but at the end, we'll take a Q&A section and she will be handling that. So again, thank you for being here. We're super excited. We hope you get something great out of it. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Barb now, who is going to tell us all about training techniques and how to keep your animals safe uh, and prevent losing your pooch. So I will give the floor to her. Thank you, Barb. All right, thank you, Rachel. Um, the first thing I'm going to talk about is collars. And um, Rachel mentioned the Martingale collar, and I'm gonna save that one for last um, because this is going to be a really safe way to make sure that you keep your dog um, with you in your home. So the first collar that I want to show you is just a regular buckle collar. This type of collar um, is okay, but dogs are, have been known to pull back and they can slip their little heads right out of these. So um, that's one particular style right there. Then we have the clasp style collar, which is got the little buckle clasp like this. 
This one concerns me, especially for stronger dogs, because I've seen dogs literally break these. So um, they're okay for, you know, a backup collar or something like that. But if I had to choose between these two, I would definitely cho choose the one that looks like a belt buckle that you would actually buckle um, on your dog. The other one I'm going to show you is the Martingale collar, which is what um, Rachel mentioned earlier. This one, it looks like a regular collar, doesn't it? But what's really cool about a Martingale collar is that it has this little sway system in the front and I'm gonna turn it sideways so you can see it. So if your dog tries to back out of this collar, it's gonna give them a gentle hug and there's no way they can back out of this collar. So these are the safest. Now I have um, my oldest rescue, Smash, we call him our Franken puppy because he's you know 50% Staffordshire Terrier, but he's got Lhasa Apso and Karen Terrier. And so he's got all these different body parts that really don't fit him. And his head is very small for his body. I have to use a Martingale collar for him because he can back out of any other cell collar. So these are really the safest. Um, then I'm going to talk about um, harnesses. Now, there are several different styles of harnesses. This happens to be a no pull harness. This one, this brand is my personal favorite, but there are lots of different harnesses that are available out there that are no pull. This one's an easy walk harness made by PetSafe. Uh, there's a sensation harness, there's a freedom harness, uh, Victoria Stillwell has a no pull harness. So there are several different styles, but this particular one um, I like just because I know they work. I've tested a lot of these products for manufacturers and I use them on my dogs. I kind of rotate them and I get the best response for the no pull from an easy walk. So little Missy's chewing her little stick here, but I wanted to kind of show you how you can use this in combination with a Martingale collar because when you bring a dog in from a new environment, they're going to be skittish. They're going to be a flight risk. And so you really want to have a two system um, of the buckle collar, I mean the martingale collar, and then a harness. Because that way, if one fails, you've still got the dog. Okay, so I'm going to get little Missy up. I will show you how to do this. Now this easy walk harness is really cool because there's always a vibrant color um, and then kind of a, a more mute color. In this case, this one's gray. And so what I like to do to make it easy to, to put these on and to fit them is I like to clasp the colorful piece first. You see that? And now it just looks like an oversized collar, right? Then you want to hold the word easy walk right here in your right hand as you approach the dog. Now again, some dogs are going to be maybe a little fearful, maybe even afraid of this. And so if you're concerned about that, you can take a little treat Put your hand completely through the harness. Missy, she's chewing on her stick. I gave that to her to keep her quiet. Yes, good girl. And while she's eating, you see her. You can, whoopsie, you can put it right over their head. Then all you have to do is clasp under the tummy. Now what I would do with a new dog, if it's an adopted dog, a dog coming into foster, is I would clip a second leash on this martingale. She's got a martingale uh, collar on too. Now you have two leashes. There's no way you're going to lose this dog. What I personally recommend as well is when you're walking the dog, have the leash that's on the harness be your primary leash. You don't want any tension on this martingale. This is just your backup leash, okay? And someone mentioned that they wanted me to demonstrate how to hold the leash too, because it's important that you um, hold the leash properly too, because 
even if you're hanging on to two leashes, if you're not hanging on to that leash right, you could lose that dog. So what I do is I put my thumb through the loop on the top of the leash, see that? And then you can gather, whoopsie, now you've got a really strong grip on that dog. The other thing that's important is this, I brought this leash out to show you, see how much longer this leash is? You don't wanna have a lot of sway in your leash. You want your leash to be about four to six you know, feet long. So you can put your thumb through that loop and now you can gather up a little bit. So now you've just got a nice tight grip on that leash so you're not gonna lose that dog. I don't know what it is, but it drives me crazy when people do this. If that dog bolts, whoop, that dog is gone. And another thing is, is if you've got a big strong dog, now little Missy, we call her our itty bitty little pity, but she's still strong. If she were to pull really hard on my wrist, I mean, she could sprain it, she could injure me. That's why it's important to put your thumb through that loop so that you've got that nice tight grip and you're not gonna lose that dog. The other leash that I use sometimes is, it's in combination with a waist clasp. And you can put this around your waist and clip the leash into the buckle right there. Now you've got your whole body for leverage. Again, you're not gonna lose that dog. I would only hook one leash to the waist leash though, because remember your other leash is your backup leash. Uh, another leash that you can use, especially if your dog gets loose. This is, oh, she found, she found a treat. She's in the way, there you go, good girl. This is a slip lead. See how it kind of slides? And again, if your dog is frightened, your dog got out of the yard, you want to retrieve it, again, put your hand through the leash. Offer them something yummy, I have cheese in my hand, and then you're going to draw the leash over their head. Now you've got that slip lead and you're not going to lose them. If you're ever in an emergency situation, a plain old regular leash can be a slip lead. Put the, the hook through the handle, and you've got a makeshift slip lead. You can capture the dog by just using that end of the leash instead of the clip, okay? For some dogs that are really frightened, I, I carry one of these in my truck everywhere I go because I've actually rescued dogs off the road. I've had to go rescue a couple of my grand pups. Um, and this you can use as a really long slip lead but it gives your dog or the dog you're saving a little space so that they don't feel like they're right on top of you. And you can give them time to kind of calm down. You can keep tossing them the food, but you're giving them a little distance away from you and it helps to keep them more relaxed and calm. Uh, I'd also like to talk about situations where you'll get a dog into your home and you're thinking, well, maybe I should put that dog outside and you're relaxed, but the dog is new to the environment and that dog could conceivably bolt right out your front door or right out your back door. And so having a gated system, always being prepared, use your backup leashes to make sure that even if you're going to put them on a tie out or if you're gonna walk them to go to the bathroom, you're going to use your harness and your martingale, you've got your two leash system, you're not going to lose them. Um, I think that's all the goodies that I had on my stack here to show you. So I hope that it was informative. I hope you learned a couple of things, but I always say when you get a new dog in a new environment, err on the side of caution, and you'll never have to be you know, making that emergency phone call. Absolutely. And I know that Jessica's going to talk a little bit more about um, fight or flight and how, you know, the most important times is when an animal is coming into a new place um, with a new experience and they might be really cautious. I had a question for you, Barb. I don't know if this, anybody's asked this, but I'm going to ask it. Um, when you first get a foster dog, how long do you think that they should 
be walking on a double leash. Also, if you have a fenced in backyard um, and you have a very skittish dog, is your recommendation not to ever let them free in the yard, even if it's fully fenced? You would be amazed at what dogs can do to get out of a yard, <laughs> especially in, if they're new to the environment, they've got that fight or flight going in their amygdala, they don't know if it's gonna be okay. Um, I would recommend giving them a little freedom, but using like a long line like this, even if you have a fenced in yard, you could use a tie out for a while. It's all about waiting for that dog to acclimate. And we all know that every dog is different, but you know, it can take quite a while before a dog reaches their comfort zone to the part, to the point where they're not feeling like they have to get out of Dodge. Right. That makes sense. Um, and then one thing that Barb taught me the other day that I didn't know is that we, we give slip leads to a lot of our um, foster families because we want the double leashing system. We're lucky that Thrivent is giving us 400 Martingales, but um, we will still be giving out slip leads uh, occasionally. And one thing that Barb was really, um, that made a lot of sense after she said it was that the slip lead should always be the fail safe. So you want the tension on the normal collar always. You don't want the tension on that slip lead. The slip lead is only there in case something happens. The dog starts backing up, the other leash or collar breaks. Um, and that's something that I didn't know. I always kind of used them in tandem. And really that's there as a protection, not as the main um, way to walk your animal because it really can hurt their vocal cords, their neck. Um, and so thank you for teaching me that. So I wanted to to pass the knowledge on. All right, cool. Um, Kelly, any questions for, nope, we're good. And keep sending questions as they come up. So no worries there. Um, next we have Jessica. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Jessica Standard. As Rachel mentioned, I am the lost dog coordinator here at Secondhand Hounds. I will be covering three main topics tonight. First up is what steps you should take when your dog gets lost. Second is how to approach a dog. And the third is the fight or flight response. Before I get started, I want to also uh, make note that although we are focusing on dogs, many of these will also apply to cats too. Okay, so first up, uh, what steps should you take if your dog is lost? So you'll first want to set out food and water bowls and fill them with yummy food, uh, such as steak, chicken, tuna, and then also some familiar items such as a dog bed, a blanket, kennel, or clothing items that have your scent and place them in the area where the dog was lost or last seen. You should also create a flyer with Lost Dogs Minnesota. You can post these flyers on Facebook, Nextdoor, or other social media platforms. You'll also wanna contact your local law enforcement, animal control, uh, vet clinics and humane societies, as well as your microchip company, which will also be discussed later to let them know that the dog is missing. If the dog is lost for more than several hours, you should consider making signs and print out flyers to post around in the area. This will help bring awareness um, and help with sightings to see where the dog may be hanging out, which will also help potentially live trapping the animal if, if that's necessary. Uh, you'll want to distribute flyers door to door. Uh, local businesses, restaurants, and other highly populated areas where the dog was last seen or went missing. Posters should be placed at nearby intersections as well as the uh, home where the dog went missing from. The signs should be in bright color and large lettering should be used to ensure that people driving by can easily read the signs. You'll want to make sure that you're tracking where you're hanging the flyers and posters so that you're able to take them down when the dog is found. Be aware of potential scams when posting flyers and posters. If someone's asking for something in return, such as a code, it is likely a scam. Be sure that you're also recording all sightings with timestamps and dates. You should also be asking the caller which direction the dog was heading in and if they appear to be in any physical pain, such as limping or a broken leg. Recording the sightings can help safely capture the dog as well as maintaining sign placements. Next up, how should you approach a dog? You should never assume that a dog is friendly or social, 
And you should also never chase or run after a dog as this may cause them to get scared and run, which, will which is also known as the fight or flight, which will be discussed next. Also avoid eye contact if possible. This can be really scary to some dogs. Once you're close enough to a dog, calmly sit down with food in your hand and toss it towards the dog. You'll want to use food to lure the dog close enough to be able to put on a slip lead as Barb just showed us. Try not to make any sudden movements as this may startle the dog. You should try to use positive words such as treat or go for a walk or other commands your dog may know. Another trick that might be helpful in catching a dog is open your car door and you might also want to say let's go for a ride. Some dogs will actually just hop in the car. The main goal is to keep the dog in the area. So leaving food, water, shelter is key to ensuring the dog is not forced to run out of fear and be able to uh, safely catch the dog. So lastly, I wanted to just, just discuss uh, fight or flight. So the fight or flight response is an innate survival instinct. So during this response, there is a release of hormones and neurotransmitters that causes a variety of physiological changes within a dog. To name a few, it is increased heart rate, increased breathing, dilated pupils, heightened senses, appetite suppression, and the inability to concentrate on complex tasks. Their focus is on running away and fighting back. They lack impulse control and lowered threshold, meaning a dog is more likely to bite during this response. These are only a few of the physiological responses that a dog may or may not experience. Some potential triggers for the fight or flight in dogs is a dog that is fearful of children but is being cornered by a child, fireworks, overstimulation or insufficient stimulation, separation anxiety, or not being how, taught how to be alone, or changes in environment, which we kind of mentioned above as well. So that could include schedule, uh, people, animals, noise, for example. Uh, uh, many dogs do go missing after they arrive. Um, that could be either to their foster home after spending some time either in transport or at another shelter, or even when they go to their forever home after being in their foster. So double leashing and paying close attention to dogs during this time is critical. As previously mentioned, you should never chase a dog. Um, many animals that have been injured while lost are due to people chasing the dog because it, it causes them to go into fight or flight and they run. It should also be noted that when a dog is in this fight or flight mode, they may not even recognize their owner or their foster. You might call to the dog and it, it may still run. Um, so if you do catch a loose dog, your first stop should be a vet clinic or an animal control center to get the dog scanned for a microchip. Before I hand it over to Heidi, our microchip coordinator, to speak more about that, are there any questions? It looks like somebody, um, do, Kelly, do you want to, do you want, should I just keep going? Go ahead. <laughs> I, Go for it. I can't stop talking sometimes. For those of you who know me, you know it's the truth. Anyway, um, somebody asked if the dog lost is a foster, should the human foster do all of these steps on their own or will secondhand hounds help? I think that is a great question for Jessica. That is a really, really great question. Um, so we actually do have a phone number for lost dogs. It goes directly to me. I don't have it memorized off the top of my head, which is really sad, <laughs> but um, we can definitely send it out in this email too. Um, but no, you'll definitely contact me. Um, I will do almost all of this, to be honest. Um, I will, you know, create the flyer. I'll get things posted. I don't have Nextdoor. Um, so that is something that, you know, the, the foster can do. The foster is also welcome to help out as much as they can in any of these steps. Um, but for the majority, you know, it'll come to me. So as far as like posting the flyers and the signs, those are all things that either myself or a volunteer will take care of. Um, but the foster is always encouraged to help if they can. And if, the, if it is an adopter, adopted dog that this is happening with, we're still willing to help. Um, the, you know, once the secondhand hounds, always the secondhand hounds, it's kind of how I feel about it. So we definitely want to assist anybody um, when that happens. Sometimes we have to go to um, using live traps. I think it's really important, Jessica said, that 
Um, sometimes animals won't even recognize yourself, you know, your, their own owner. Um, my dog got out in 2014 when she was two years old and she's this huge Great Dane. And she was in full on flight or fight or flight mode and she chose flight and was running. And so a lot of the times we're actually not able to catch these animals on our own. Like we're not, it's not some like dramatic jump on the animal with the slip lead, like I caught the animal. It's a lot of the times making sure that the animal is staying close to the designated spot and then utilizing a live trap. And I actually feel like this isn't something that um, we had talked about before, but I feel like talking a little bit about live traps would be cool because I think a lot of people automatically think it's some like scary booby trap um, like that you used to build with your, you know, friends, neighborhood friends to like catch a squirrel. I don't know if anybody else did that. Never to hurt the squirrel, but just to like have a squirrel pet. Um, so we don't want to do that, but uh, our live traps are actually really humane and they are lifesavers in a lot of these cases because these animals are not ever going to let somebody get close enough to like actually catch them with a slip lead. So Jessica, do you want to touch on that really quick? So to be honest, I actually have not used a live trap yet. Um, as you mentioned, I am pretty new here. So I personally haven't used them, but I know that we did actually use one on a recent dog, but I was actually out of town that weekend. Um, so I don't know if Carrie can jump in a little bit on some of that. Otherwise, we can definitely put something together and um, send it out in, the, in an email too. I'm happy to jump in. Um, so, and just to clarify, Secondhand Hounds doesn't have any large enough live traps for most of the bigger dogs that have gone missing. Um, that might be something that we um, purchase in the future, but we do work with some of the other organizations and some of our really close volunteers who have traps and we have used them in the past. The most important thing is to keep um, a feeding station going with really stinky people food so that that dog stays in that area and to make sure nobody is disturbing it so it doesn't run away. And then the traps are really just um, a door that, you know, is hinged open. And when the animal steps on a plate near the food, the door shuts behind them. That's it. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't even touch the animal. So it's definitely humane, like Rachel said. Um, and it's a great way if you have a dog that you can't get near, if you can get it to keep eating in the same place, you can eventually use a trap to uh, catch it. Thanks, Gary. Okay, so we do have two more questions. The first is, if I find a dog that appears to be lost and it doesn't have a microchip, should I then bring it to secondhand hounds so you can find its home or find it a new one? That might be a more of a Rachel question. Yeah, <laughs> I can talk about that. Oh my gosh. So one of my long-term dreams is to be able to be kind of an animal control for the Minnetonka area, like a holding station. But right now we legally can't do that. So there's a few ways that we can handle this. Um, one is you contact your local animal control facility and you can actually end up um, bringing the animal there and they will do their best to find it its home. And then the nice thing about local animal control is many, many, many of them are low or no kill. So you don't have to worry about it. Like if I have a dog down in Kentucky and I bring it to a shelter, there's a good chance that animal might have to be euthanized due to space. That's not really happening in Minnesota, which is a wonderful thing. So I don't feel too bad if you do have to work with animal control and drop the dog off at animal control. The other option is if you can keep it in your own home for five days, and do due diligence in looking for its owner. So posting signs, posting on Humane Society, doing the lost dogs, all the stuff. Um, then you can actually apply to surrender a stray to our rescue after that five day holding period. So those are the two um, options that you have with secondhand hounds. That doesn't guarantee that we'll be able to take the dog. Obviously we need to have a suitable foster home. It depends if the dog is friendly with other dogs, kids, you know, all that stuff. So no guarantees there. But we have taken several strays that the people have done, the finders have done due diligence to make sure that they're looking for that owner. And when they can't, then it becomes a secondhand hounder. So I hope that helps answer that question. Perfect. And then the other question was, do you recommend trackers or locators that you put on their collars? If so, what kind? So that's a really great question. Um, I may have to loop in Carrie or get back to you on this question. So I know that we have a trail cam, um, but I haven't worked too much with trackers and locators. I do know that it is common for people that have flight risk dogs to use them and they seem to work really well from what I've heard. 
Um, Carrie, do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, I, the only one that I know that I have experience with is the FI, F-I collar. Um, that seems to work really well for people. It, it shows you right on your phone where your animal is. Um, there are some other kinds that work with your home's Wi-Fi to alert you anytime your dog or cat goes out of the range. A lot of people use those for cats. Um, uh, if they go out of the range of your Wi-Fi, it'll alert you. But that doesn't really help you much when the dog is on the other side of that area. It's not something you can just go track. Whereas the Fi actually is GPS locator anywhere. Um, that's the only brand I'm familiar with, but I think there are others out there that work just as well. Whistle is another one that is similar. I think it also tracks their like steps, if that's something you're interested in. <laughs> and it looks like someone else um, typed in, but I think it just went to panelists. Findster Duo is an awesome tracker, no monthly fees. And I'll, I'll put these in the chat for everyone to see. If you want to um, pop in the chat, I'll put the three that we just mentioned um, so everyone can see those. Perfect. Um, we, do have, we did have our own dog, uh, a husky that kept getting out that we did end up getting a tracker. The adopters got a tracker for him, I think, him. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he was a stinker. He just wanted to go on joy runs all the time. So, uh, you know, some of these dogs, we, they definitely can be utilized for. And I think especially those puppy mill dogs, that's pretty important. Um, usually they'll just kind of hunker down and stay in the space. But I think something that's been a problem when we're looking for a lost dog is that people don't know not to chase a dog. They think they see a stray dog and your instinct is, oh my gosh, I want to rescue that dog. I'll do anything it takes. And they start running after the dog or driving and chasing the dog. And that's like the worst thing that you can do. Um, and so getting the word out about that as well. So on our signs, we even say, do not chase, do not approach, just call us so that we can kind of consolidate and figure out where the dog is hanging out and then we can utilize those live traps um so that's just another thing i uh, i talked to a lot of people when we had uh one of our last lost dogs who called me and they're like we're we're trying to corner the dog and i'm like no 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 no, don't do that the dog's been you know running for three days this dog is in that flight mode you're not going to be able to catch it so our our biggest goal is to figure out where it's staying and make sure it stays there and doesn't run into a busy road and get hit by a car um alrighty sorry we have one more question hey <laughs> um and this is a really good one so the question is when you say do not chase and your dog runs out the door and is running around the neighborhood and beyond do you sit at your front door with food and wait for them to come back? Um, that can be really scary as well. So maybe um, like what are like the first steps that you that you take there? I can take that unless Jessica wants to take it. I'll let you take it. Okay, sounds good. Um, that's a great question. You know, it depends. I think a big part of this, and actually I would love to hear if Barb agrees with me because she's the trainer, I'm not. But I think it depends on your dog's personality. Um, some dogs, if you know them well, like when my little scruffle muffin gets out because my kids open the door and he's like going to go sniff the neighbor's yard, I don't just stay there and, you know, drop down and say, okay, I'm going to wait till the dog comes back. Here's some food that I'll, I'll walk over slowly and calmly and try to like, just get him on his slip lead. Um, if it's a dog that you don't know well, um, and the dog is running around and it's scared, then I for sure wouldn't chase is my, that, I mean, chasing any dog that is scared and in that fight or flight mode, especially puppy mill dogs, is not the way to go. Uh, like Jessica said, get that stinky food, the stinkier the better, get it in your yard, make sure the dog's coming to you as opposed to you approaching it. Now, if it's a new dog and it seems super friendly, but it, it thinks you're playing a game of chase, again, we don't want to be chasing these dogs because then they're gonna do zoomies and they're gonna run into a busy road and get hit by a car. What we want to do is drop to our butts or sit down. Come here, puppy. Hi, buddy. You know, super. You can if it's not scared. That that might be. I'm probably scared of all of your dogs at home. But uh, you know, you want to make those cute little sounds. Try to get them to come. Find that stinky food. Stay low. Not trying to like make yourself look like a big monster. Um, and so I always kind of drop to the ground and and do like the come here, puppy. Like. And, and so that they don't think it's a game. They're not trying to run. They're like, well, this isn't fun. She's not even coming after me. Um, Barb, do you have anything to add to that? 
Um, if it's a dog that's familiar to you, this is going to sound really silly, but actually laying down on the ground flat, they will sometimes get very curious about why is my mom doing that? Why is my mom laying flat on the ground? And a lot of times they'll, they'll think they need to come to your aid. Um, and again, if it's a dog that you know and you know its personality, you never want to chase the dog, but you can make a game of chase and you can run away and get them really revved up and then run right through the door. Thank you, Barb. All right. I think lastly, we have Miss Heidi Burley, who's going to talk to us about um, microchips. And Heidi, it's not letting me automatically unmute you, so you might have to unmute yourself. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Cool. Uh, as Rachel said, I'm Heidi Burley and I am the microchip coordinator at Secondhand Hounds. And hopefully I can answer the question for you of why we should all microchip our animals. Um, some of the recent statistics from the Humane Society is that um, 10 million dogs and cats go missing every year, which translates to one out of three of our dogs are going to go missing at some point in their lifetime. Um, and in addition to some of the things that Jessica had said, there are ways that you can um, increase the probability of them coming home. And one of the things I would always recommend is do have tags on your dog's collar um, that have your phone number on it, maybe have your phone number in the collar itself. Um, but to be honest, that doesn't necessarily always cover you because if you've ever noticed your dog's tags, the numbers can um, can actually like wipe off or over time they get worn off. So, um, and someone can, if they are stolen, someone can remove that those tags. So I, I always recommend um, microchipping. One of the things that they found is when a dog does end up at the Humane Society, a dog that is not microchipped only 22% make it back home. If a dog is microchipped, the percentage goes up to 52. But the reason that, that it's only at 52 is that they've also found that 58% of microchips are never actually registered to their owners. So people don't take the time to actually um, correspond their information to that dog or they don't keep it up to date, so they're never able to get a hold of those people. So um, the to explain what a microchip is, it's actually a computer chip that is the size of a piece of rice, and it is implanted directly underneath the skin in your dog. Um, it does give them a little prick, but it really doesn't hurt. Um, but it will, and it will move around in the body over time. So when they scan, they have to scan the entire body to try to find it. But that microchip all it has on it is the, the number. And so we are responsible for then, and we as the dog owners are responsible to make sure that we are corresponding our information to that chip by registering it with a chip company. Once you do register it, it goes into a universal um, database lookup. So no matter what, what kind of chip you have and where it's registered, um, anybody who scans your dog would be able to um, find the information on your dog or where it's registered and be able to get it back to you. If your dog does go missing, you can also inform that, that um, chip company that it's missing and they'll send out, I get, I get flyers all the time of dogs in our area that are missing just because I'm hooked up to all of the different microchip companies. So, um, they will send it out to people in the area to, to tell them that your dog is missing. But once someone finds them and they call your chip company, your chip company will get a hold of you many different ways, whether it's emailing, trying to call you, whatever information you have on there, um, they'll, they'll try to call you like immediately. It's almost an instantaneous response once someone has it in there. Um, so why would you want that microchip? Well, first off, it's not like a collar or something. It stays with them for life. It's not going to, um, they very, very, very rarely would mal malfunction. Um, they do, um, once, once they're registered, that information, even if, even if you, um, 
change it. It's going to stay with probably the, like here at Second Hand Hounds, we um, have a guardian program on our chips so that they can always um, find out who purchased the chip and come back and find out who got that chip. Um, but you still want to keep that information up to date. The other thing is if you do travel with your dog, I, our dogs come with us out of state quite often. Um, some states don't have the five day hold like we have. And so you want to make sure that you're contacted right away because you don't know where they've taken your dog or if it, if it gets off. So um, it is an incredibly low cost to chip your dog to keep them safe. Um, dogs and cats that have a microchip are twice as likely, and actually they say cats are 20 times more likely to be able to come back home if it is chipped. Um, if, you, if you have resident dogs that do not have chips, um, you'll notice that secondhand hounds every once in a while will send out a flyer. Right now they're kind of on hold because, because of COVID, but we do do um, chip and clip clinics where you can come in and we'll um, um, chip your dog for you. Otherwise, very, um, since we're not doing those right now, very, very shortly, Secondhand Hounds is going to be opening their vet clinic, which is probably the, one of the best assembled team of vets that you can find. And they're going to be opening it to the public. So you are going to be able to come and get vet care at our clinic. So um, does anybody have any questions? Otherwise, I'll turn it back over to Rachel. There was a good um, reminder in here in the chat that said, um, remember, or it's important to keep your info current as well. So if you yeah. move, you get a new phone number um, to keep that up to date as well. Yep. I think there is two, um, two things that we were talking about as far as myth busting. I think you covered them, Heidi, but I'm going um, oh. to talk about them again a tiny bit. One, it's not a tracking system. I think a lot of people think microchips will somehow track your dog or cat, and it doesn't, but it helps if they get found. Um, yeah. And then the second thing is that um, I know when I got my dog chipped with a home again chip, um, I, at the very beginning, this was like in 2010, um, and they sent me all these reminders of like $9.99 a month. And I was like, man, microchips are expensive. And I didn't realize that it's actually just a one-time enrollment fee. You can get all these bells and whistles for $9.99 a month, apparently, or you could in 2010. Um, but you don't need to do that. It is just a one-time fee to change ownership. Um, but like Heidi said, if you have a Secondhand Hounds alumni and it um, is chipped, if you didn't register it, they can tell that we purchased the, the chip and they will contact us and say, hey, we found a dog that is um, was purchased, you know, the chip was purchased by your organization. Um, and then I had one other thing and it's, it left my mind. I can't remember what it was. I think it's probably the other thing that I forgot. And that is that, is that um, most people think that their information is on that chip. It is not. There's no information on that chip except for the number and your information will never be on that chip. It's just on, in the web, in the um, chip company's website. Yeah. And Donnie had a good um, a good note as well. Have your vet check periodically to make sure the chip hasn't yeah. shifted or come out, um, which is very rare, but has happened in the past. Yeah. And then I just need to echo what Heidi said. Our vet center is amazing. So um, if you do need a chip for your pet or you know somebody that does, uh, we should be open to the public in by January 2021 is the goal. And um, and so, and that money, every, anything you spend there goes back to rescuing animals through secondhand hounds, which is pretty cool. So we're excited. Um, do you want me to read this question, Kelly? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, it looks like, so Jennifer asked about a GPS tracking device. And those are the ones that we put in there earlier. Hopefully that went to the attendees. I'll put them in again. Um, the fi or fee whistle and finester. Um, but then there was another question in the Q&A, if you wanted, if that was the you, one that you we were going to grab. I'll, I'll, I'll let you read. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I think we kind of covered this a little bit, but um, the question is, if the foster adopter responsible, is the foster adopter responsible to call vets, police, etc., or do secondhand hounds do that part? 
So um, like Jessica said, we will do a lot of it, uh, everything that we can, but we always love help from our foster or our adopter. So for example, um, Jessica has a checklist that she goes down and she makes sure she's hitting everything that we need to hit. That being said, we don't call every vet clinic in the vicinity. So if that's something that you want to do extra from our process, that is amazing. We are working on having a lost dogs uh, portion to our website, which will kind of outline exactly what we want to do. And sometimes it helps to kind of tag team those things so that they get done quicker. Jessica is one human. And so, uh, so it takes her a long time to make sure she's registering everything. So if, for example, if the foster's like, I will take calling the police, I will take posting on Craigslist, then Jessica can focus on lost dogs, humane society, um, making sure we have volunteers in the area looking sign making is really important. So um, that's kind of a non-answer, but I hope it helped you understand the process. But we, we will do as much as we, as, as our process says we do. And then anything additional is like icing on the cake. We're happy to have it. Carrie might want to say something about that as well. I do. I just want to point out that, um, so Nextdoor, which is a great resource because it's the people, if your dog was missing at your home, that's usually, you know, if the dog is somewhere in your neighborhood, we can't access Nextdoor for everybody's neighborhoods. That's something that the foster would have to do because I can only access my neighborhood. And so um, definitely we hope that the fosters will help us out in that regard. Plus, you guys know your neighbors, you know whose doors you can bang on and hand a flyer to, and that's something boots on the ground that you can do much quicker than we can do not being in your neighborhood. So. Love it. Um, Jennifer, no problem. Our, my internet sucks all the time, so I get it. Any other questions about that? And then we have questions about the vet center, which I am happy to talk about all day long. Um, I'll let, I'll let Kelly keep looking for questions, but can you bring any rescue to your clinic? It doesn't even have to be a rescue. You can bring any dog or cat. I'm going to be honest. I brought my foster bearded dragon to the clinic last week. So they might even trim your foster bearded dragon's nails. I don't know. Um, but yes, for sure. Dogs, cats, absolutely. It's going to be open to anyone. Um, it's the first kind of model of anything you spend there is actually going back into the organization, the rescue. So I am like uh, over the moon for that. I'm super excited. Um, we are going to actually be promoting, you can go on our main website right now, secondhandhounds.org. The second slider on the homepage actually has a button where you can sign up on our newsletter just for the vet center. Um, and you will get first updates on when it's opening, where it's located, all of that stuff. It is right next door to Second Hand Hounds. It's in Minnetonka. I never say never. So you just wait. We might be franchising all over the Twin Cities. Um, but we've got to make this first one successful. So I hope everyone here will consider switching their vet care to the Second Hand Hounds Veterinary Center. We have the best team of doctors and vet techs and assistants. I trust them with all of my dog's lives. And um, I'm super excited to be able to offer that to other people as well. So yes, sorry. I get really excited about that. Any other questions that you see Kelly coming through? There is one other question about um, having a standard answer when people on next door post about a missing pet. That is a great idea. It's not something that we have, but I think we're gonna put it on our list because I love that idea. Um, you know, I think the more we get out the process and how to do it, and also once we have that lost dog section on the website, that's going to be public information. That might be a really nice link to send to anybody missing a dog so that they have their own personal checklist, even if it's not about secondhand hounds. Anybody that knows me knows that I am 100% about doing whatever for whoever. Uh, it doesn't have to be a secondhand hounds animal by any means. So if we can spread that information, I think it would be great for the whole community to have. So once we have that, we'll send that out to everybody on this call and promoting it via our social media pages. So keep an eye out for that as well. Any other questions that you see? Are we good? While we're on the topic of next door, um, one, someone was wondering if after we are done with this meeting and have the recording, if it's something that could be shared on next door. Yes. I know personally, I see a ton of lost cats on my next door. So it would be a good recording to post to my neighborhood. For sure. But, yeah. 
Yeah, I love that. Um, we are definitely planning on promoting this on our social media channels as well as um, probably having a link in our newsletter so people can watch this even if they couldn't attend tonight. Um, so hopefully we will be able to do that soon. But yes, I think that uh, it's a great way for people to learn more about lost dog prevention. Um, and then as far as a question for all of you, if there's anything that we didn't cover that you really were hoping that we would, let us know. This is something that I would love to do more often, maybe a, a bi-annually uh, webinar just to refresh people. Um, we're always learning and we love learning. So please tell us if you had a different experience, um, if you have tips and tricks that we didn't talk about, the more the merrier. We love information um, and we want to do best by our fosters and our adopters and our community at large. So please don't be shy about saying, hey, I loved it, or hey, this could have been better, because we want to hear all the feedback. Um, Lori, okay. you've done a ton. You're amazing. Um, Lori Anderson is so, 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 she's amazing. She has had a lot of experience with rescuing animals. So Lori, you should probably just be on this panel, but thank you for all you've done. <laughs> So there is another question that I, um, I know Barb will want to answer. So it is, I have an invisible fence. Would you recommend waiting a year or so before using it with my new rescue? Um, I would say don't use it at all. Um, <laughs> um, there's been a lot of research on punitive based methods of training and um, it's never a guarantee. Um, sometimes the pain is worth what's on the other side of that line. And um, my daughter has a neighbor that is a perfect example of this. The guy got this beautiful black lab. He put in the invisible fencing. There's a public sidewalk on the back side of his house. And every day when my daughter walked her dogs over her lunch hour, he would bust through that invisible fencing and come to say hi. And he was a sweet dog, so it wasn't like a, a, a dangerous situation. But about a month and a half in, the guy ended up putting up a regular fence. Because, he, you know, he, he chatted with my daughter and he said, I've got this thing up on 10 and it doesn't matter to him. Yeah. Um, Invisible fences can be, um, I have a lot of friends that use them. Um, and I think that some dogs are fine. Like, like Barb said, some dogs are fine with them. Some dogs will always find a way to get through. And also one thing to note, and I'm not trying to knock invisible fences too much, but, um, but I have seen really nice dogs actually get aggressive because they can't leave the area and they know that, but the, any predator or what they perceive as a threat they know that that threat can come into them. So they become yes. super defensive. And so some of these rescue yes. dogs that don't have all that positive um, interaction as puppies with other dogs can actually become really aggressive at the fence line, even if they're nice dogs elsewhere. So that's just something to look out for in general. Um, well, yeah. And the research on, on uh, territorial, like property line aggression, the research on invisible fencing and, and that um, we call them follow behaviors, is, is very high. And just one little follow-up. I know we're very, very close at time and I've been taking screenshots to make sure I'm not missing anything. So if I have, we'll follow up with you. Um, but just to kind of wrap this, the, the invisible fence conversation, um, if you can't do a real fence, what do you do? I would recommend a tie out, but I don't know if there's other things because there are some lots that you just whether you can't fence them or it's expensive, what would you recommend in that situation? Well, believe it or not, you can use the same training that you would use to train for invisible fencing, less the shock, and you can boundary train dogs. We did this for my dad's dog up at the lake. Um, the neighbors um, thought that I was some kind of a witch <laughs> because Minnie never left the yard. And all we did was we went and bought blue electrical flags because dogs can see blue. And we boundary trained her. We made it beneficial for her to stay on that side of the line and she never left the yard. Um, 
and again, there's no 100% guarantee with that either, but at least you don't have any fallout behaviors that are going to develop because there's no pain involved. Right. And some dogs are going to, you know, I have two, two, I have three dogs and two of them stick around the yard. They do not, they, they are not wanderers. They don't chase things. They just kind of want to be, they're just loungy dogs. And then I have my pit bull who's like, she just wants to go explore the neighborhood and jump in puddles and get into trouble. Uh, and so for a dog like her, I don't know if boundary training would ever work. Barb could probably make it work because like she said, she's, she, she's got the witchy, the witchiness that makes things happen. Um, but for me, when I didn't have a fenced in yard, that was, I walked her. That was our outdoor time. We walked together. It's a really great way to bond. And then I utilized a tie out. Um, and, and the tile was great for her, um, because I could trust that she wasn't going to go anywhere. Um, but I did have to monitor it a little bit more closely. Um, so those would be my two suggestions as well is, is just the, pretend you're in an apartment you don't have a fenced in yard or you utilize that tie out, uh, is important. But, you know, there are, pulley, there are pulley systems too, like dog run pulley systems that you can buy that give the dogs, um, even more freedom. Yeah. And like we said, I, I have some friends that have invisible fences and it works really well for them. So I know it does work in, it, they just make me nervous. So I think that's what we want to convey a little bit. Um, I for sure would say no shot collar. Um, you know, I, I, especially for a dog with epilepsy, um, I would, I would steer clear of that. I, a lot of trainers suggest this. I know it drives Barb up the wall. Um, there's a difference too, between a shock collar and a vibration collar. Um, so like a vibration collar, that's not a shock collar set on the lowest setting. It's a totally different thing. And it literally just gives them a feeling. So they, it's almost like clicker training with a vibration, um, versus a shock collar, which actually sends a shock. I don't know if anybody's actually worn one of these. I have, cause I'm crazy. And I wanted to see what it's like super uncomfortable, nothing. And I was on like level two, nothing that you'd really want to do with your animal. And, um, especially with epilepsy, I worry about anything that triggers that epilepsy and those pains can some that could easily do that. Um, but I get having a giant Labrador named cupcake, which is the best name for a giant Labrador. That's her dog, her dog's name, um, uh, is super fast, has anxiety, She's had to chase him so many times. He gets out of any and all harnesses and collars. We started training then COVID. We need to get back as soon as we can. Barb, this will be our last thing. And then we will hop off. Um, and any other questions we will follow up with. I just want to keep, keep my eye on the time. But what would you recommend for Cupcake, who is a Houdini, gets off everything, has anxiety, and runs away? <laughs> Definitely a martingale collar. She will not get out of that collar. And two, two leash system. Harness, one leash, martingale, second leash. Here's little Missy's martingale. Um, she, will not, she will not get away. We talk about how um, the pinhead dogs, I don't know if I, <laughs> but I've had pinhead dogs where they have little tiny heads and big thick necks and bodies. And you're like, how can this dog possibly not slip out of the collar because their neck is bigger than their head and martingales is really what we found to work the best i don't know if you've used a martingale jennifer or not um but that's what has worked for me with my little pin 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 head, head doggy and the bigger the dog the, the thicker you want the martingale to be because you don't want to put a little skinny martingale on a big thick dog because that that could you know feel like a choke but I have three pit bulls. They all have these beautiful, thick martingale collars, and all it does is give them a little hug. Sounds good. All right. Well, thank you all so much for being here with us tonight. Um, I appreciate it so much. I thank you to our panelists who are amazing at what they do. Um, we will take all your feedback for the next one. Um, but I really, really appreciate taking you taking your Thursday night to spend it with us. Um, and then a huge thank you to Courtney and Thrivent, especially for providing us with these martingales because it's going to make such a big difference for all of our doggies. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm super excited to, to see where this can go. And we want to make every dog be safe and prevent losing them and then recover them safely and getting them back with their families is our utmost important goal. So thank you again for all your comments and questions and all that good stuff. And I hope you have a great rest of your week. 
and you stay warm, except for Jennifer in Texas and jealous. And um, I hope that you all have a great night. Thank you. Bye.